I didn't want to use the digital humanities when I started working uh, on, on projects. I, I sat down with a friend uh, who works in medicine. I asked him, give me some of your, from your group that wants to work with humanities stuff. And he said that, okay, I know this guy, Leo Lahti. We sat down and we started thinking what we can do. Uh, and, and, and we started building our own, own processes uh, to analyze, especially knowledge production, which is what, what we want to do. But I had the feeling, I mean, that also I did my PhD, even stuff like book history. Helsinki is very strong in intellectual history. That's my background. So the Quentin Skinner's Cambridge School, of, uh, for some reason, that has been implanted in, in Helsinki in particular. So all of us working in digital humanities, we've been raised up uh, following that. And I wanted to use, I mean, different methods. I, w I was very interested about the 18th century collections on right thinking when they, it came out that you could actually use it. And I spent uh, a lot of time even downloading stuff from there and uh, ridiculous things like that. So, so when, when we I, I first, when we were starting with our uh, kind of big data processes, uh, and I, I was talking to my supervisors and, and, and them, they, they were very, very skeptical, and they still are. And, and, and the, the, the kind of idea that, that w whether we are in between worlds, and then what, what is happening also, what I, I will talk about, is that my worry about digital humanities a little bit is that you go to a different place, that you stop talking to these people where you start from, and, and you create something else, and, and you have a discourse on your own. It needs to be that these are connected and not severe. So the impact on the, on the actual traditions is what, what we're aiming at. And, and that is very much uh, what, what I'm all the time thinking when I'm doing these uh, stuff that, that, that we're doing. And, and well, hopefully, I mean, the, that the in-between worlds, we, we've now got a, also we've got a center for intellectual history. It's very easy to find these, these institutions, by the way. I mean, I mean network basis. But, but anyway, it's a good idea to centralize things. And there's a center for intellectual history, and there's Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities, and these are now working together. They're really communicating, which is, which is important. That is the way to build things so, so we keep in touch all the time. And, and, and that, that is what, what is important for us. So I, I just want to show you, uh, so the kind of a, this is from the application. Um, so what, everything that is involved in, in Heldig Digital Humanities. So close collaboration with computer science. Aalto University is very good in that, and, and also uh, Uni University of Arts, there's one, one like that. So, so in Helsinki region, the idea is that everything is centra centralized, uh, centered in a way that, that we take advantage of the stuff. A little bit like Daria, I think, it, it wants to do. So there's all kinds of different things. I'm, I'm, I'm only talking now from the intellectual history and uh, history of philosophy pers perspective, but, but also, for example, that uh, at theology, religion, and, and digital world, that component is, they also want to use as particularly for the focus of the uh, existing research tradition. So there's all kinds of interesting things. Russian studies is very big. Uh, smart cities are on the board, consumer behavior, uh, and so forth. So, and, 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 and also then there's, as you see, there's Finclar in there, but maybe, maybe also Daria, uh, uh, actually Daria will be, be kind of important and a way for us to, the, also disseminate our, what we do to other parts and, and then take advantage of, of what others do elsewhere. So, so that, this kind of a setup is very important. Also the memory organizations, not only the National Library, but, but also archives and so forth. Good thing about Finland is that when you're in a small humorless country is that you can actually do things so that, that you know everyone <laughs> and, and, and you can distribute and communicate if, if the working relationship is good. And of course, I mean, it, so, so, so that, it, that is something, advantage of being small. But so, so, so this is the, uh, the kind of my list of what, what, what we try to focus on and, and what we say when we teach digital humanities, when we promote projects and what we do. I mean, the, the core research questions, they need to come first. And, and the 15 years, I mean, I've been thinking about David Hume for at least 15 years, more than that. But it took me 15 years that I felt that, okay, now I have an actual opinion how his works develop. And, and these are long, long cycles, I mean, that you can't change every year, I mean, that, that now we do this. The method development is, of course, there, but that is also why the research tradition where you're working is, is so very important. The multidisciplinarity, I mean, that comes, I, I think it comes, follows uh, immediately from there. The idea for us isn't that we want to train new type of humanists. Everybody needs to have certain set of skills 
digital, others, computer science and so forth, so that everybody speaks at least the same language. But the idea isn't that, that we will have people who are experts, well there can be some that are uh, that they're the best experts in computer science and also in, in, the, in the particular field of humanities. Usually that's not the case and that means that the cultural change needs to happen and we, because we in the humanities are always used to that, that middle-aged men write novel, uh, I mean monographs uh, when they're wise enough to talk down to the people. I mean th there's good things about this as well, the monograph tradition and so forth, but the work if we want to, if we do serious work, we need to take the advantage that, for example, bioinformatics have done. And also the, the, when we talk about data repositories, I'm a, I'm a steering group head in, in our, our university of, of, a, of a project where they're building the research data infrastructure. And, and the problem with humanities is that we don't really know what are our need, what, how they're actually going to develop. Because most of the humanities people are still kind of sleeping regarding the the, the, the research data. If I ask my professors, what's your research data? Uh, there isn't such thing. I mean, they're, they're only the publications and that's it. But the process of working and, and all of that, we need to take that very, very seriously. And the plur plurality of sources comes through that, I think. And also then respecting the computer science. So if you have a computer scientist, a serious one, very ambitious one that works with you in the humanities data, they need to get uh, I mean, because the, the applied field is the humanities. So, so like in bioinformatics, it took some time before they started to be really respected for what they do. It has happened, of course. And also then, I mean, these data management things, and the, these, the understanding what, what, what is the process and how things work, which is, of course, what Daria does. And, and this is where we really want to work with you, especially, uh, and, and collaboration which is very different from natural science in humanities where, where you, the memory organizations are the ones that have the data. So, so all of this needs to tie in and, and go together. I was in the Digital Humanities Conference in Krakow. Uh, that was my first time. Uh, at, at, and I, first I have to say it was really high quality. I was really impressed by the conference overall. But regarding the classic research questions, I am not so sure if there were many papers that actually take that into focus. So, so what happens is, is in digital humanities quite often that it's the people who work di with digital methods that then somehow have other criteria for judging their work than the others. So, so you work on, sh not always, but at least, I mean, in history this has happened a little bit. So that, that you have people who work on Shakespeare, but they use digital methods. And so whether that ties with the research, I mean, actual tradition isn't always clear. So the talk about from digital humanities 1.0, to 2.0, now some people are going to 3.0. Of course, we need to be critical and reflective about everything that we do, but I don't think that the, that the first wave has yet hit the shore. So instead of talking, I mean, we're, we're still in the beta mode in, in, in digital humanities, I think. So, so there, there are iterations like 0.2 and, and so forth, but not, definitely not 2.0 in my, 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 my view. And, uh, and just to, I mean, this, it's 15 years, if you want to think in a Kuhnian sense, a paradigm shift and so forth, uh, the time that it really takes for us to be in a place where, where we can think about sciences maturing and instead of just in the humanities, we're always said that, that we're just inventing new paradigms. Uh, but, but here maybe, maybe the, the use of the modern tools, when it's tied really to the, whatever the field, whatever the question that we are studied, understanding justice in a particular way and, and how Aristotle wasn't talking to Hobbes and who wasn't talking to us. So we, we can't have one concept, but we need to understand the change and time and so forth. So, so this is where, where the, the methods come to play and, and, and the real role. But I just like the, the idea of 15 years. I don't know why, but just 15 years. <laughs> so, but, so this is like, that, this was my setup. Uh, now I want to talk about, because I hate, the one thing that I hate about digital humanities the most is that we're always promising something that will happen maybe at some point. So we, we are actually doing things also. So, so it's not only talk about uh, how things will happen. I organized a, a conference on conceptual change with digital tools. I have got friends who, who history of philosophy people, and they're very, very critical about the fact that in digital humanities we talk about conceptual change, but the framing is, is, is so sometimes maybe, maybe a little bit short, soft, uh, so that, that isn't really contributing the way that they want to discuss the whole thing. So, I mean, my, my perspective, I mean, if I'm, if I'm looking at, okay, I, I want to understand enlightenment, let's put it like that. So enlightenment in justice, in the enlightenment 
when, when is the modern idea of distributive justice coined? How, when does it come about? What happens and so forth? So my perspective from, I mean, that what can we do with data mining is that there are two things. I mean, it's really the text mining and then there's the metadata as a quantitative tool. And, and that is what we, when we had our sit down with my friend who works in bio, bioinformatics, uh, we realized that, that a lot of that work that they are doing with uh, genome research and so forth, that can be implemented also to library catalog data, for example. But the most important thing is that, that you have, a, have to have a system where you clean the data up. So it's basic statistical work. So, so lo what happens a lot, you have these projects in humanities that say that, okay, we take the Hathi Trust, all of the three and a half million books or something, without actually touching the metadata, we take it as it is. Well, it isn't, I mean, that by knowing what's the quality, I mean, that you don't reach any results that are actually uh, reliable. But once you build, so what we've really been doing for past some years now is that, that we're building infrastructures, ecosystems, how to clean up these metadata collections. And the good thing is that once you create some tools, the, the structure of the library, I mean, the meta, people always talk how Mark is awful, which it is, and, but, but, but it's also been, so it's fairly standard everywhere. So, so that you have some language dependent problems, but once you build the tools to clean it up, you can automize the, the processes for, for, for some way and, and do things. And then, I mean, that's, so that's where we think that, that things can be really made more stable fairly easily. But then there's the, the text mining part, which is, it's, it's not so, uh, so there are ideas that we start very, very slow and we take very, very small steps in a, before we, we get where, we, where we're going. So now, I mean, the, the project under which we work is called, I mean, Academy of Finland funded project, computational history and transformation of public discourse in Finland. Uh, so, so what we want to do is to identify these uh, moments, unappreciated moments of transformation. Uh, and, and then we try to build different kinds of ways of using the existing tools, but then also develop new ones to, to do this. And uh, the work packages, and these are really based on how we think about it. So, so there's one on the, on the bibliographic metadata, and the other one is on full text analysis. But what makes this, I mean, similar projects are going on, of course. I mean, there, there's many, many of these in different countries and so forth. But what we want to do, I mean, that we're building a really an e ecosystem for analyzing them, uh, that, it, that it's, an, it's an open source way of doing. So the workflow comes such that whoever is working, especially if you're working on the Finnish newspapers, there's of course different issues, pre-processing and so forth, that all of that is shared. And also we uh, uh, were able to negotiate with the National Library that okay, if you're, open, if, if you want, if you're part of this, this application, which was successful, then we will make a data dump of the whole historic newspapers so anybody can use them as, as they wish, which they did, but which were they were first reluctant to do. And uh, so, so, so the conceptual change, I mean, that, that comes, questions like political economy, that these are really what we're interested in, I mean, that how these are discussed and how they develop in Finland, uh, and text reuse is, is one issue. Of course, fin Finland being a country where there's three official languages, but, but the Finnish Swedish is the borderline and, and how to develop these tools that the text reuse can be seen across, across the border, is, that's a very important part of the, what we try to do. And, and, and virality in the newspapers, uh, especially one of our partners is really interested about this. Before the copyright law changes to us later, 19th century, that it was very normal to, that, that the same news is, is, is distributed or, or I mean, in different, different uh, languages and, and, and especially within the, that the same news is without any quotes used in a different place. And, and our strategy, I mean, for the scientific practices isn't, I mean, that we, we really want to involve those people who have the, the needs uh, or, or the ability to, to use certain practices. So National Library of Finland is there. I mean, they, they've got a, there's a digitization center in Mikkeli. Uh, which has a project on the OCR problems. The OCR problems are great, uh, and, and this is where we've only, not, like recently, we started to find different collaborative partners from different countries that, that have the, dealing with the same issues. Because these, they're, they're the same everywhere, and, and this is really something where I think that like Daria and, and, and others could 
would be very useful, not only from the perspective of the, the, the who has the data, but especially from the research perspective, how we approach this and, and what kind of tools we really need for that. And, and, and also then, I mean, the University of Turku Department of Information Technology, so they also happen to be bioinformatics background. Uh, so so they're, they're developing the, the algorithms for, for the text reuse uh, so that it, it would be sensitive to the OCR problem. That's the text reuse uh, in a corpora where there's no, no problems is a different thing. Uh, for, for this, we need different tools. So, I mean, the Finnish newspaper collection is fairly large, uh, about three million pages. So, and, and that's one language area where I don't think many other Europeans are working. Uh, so, so in, in, in that, that sense, it's also uh, in, important in, in the Euro European scale. Uh, but, but of course, the idea that the tools, I mean, that, that the, if we can deal with the OCR problem, then that is applicable to many, many other different sources in all languages. So that, that is really one motivation for this. Quality issues, I don't know, maybe you don't want to, I mean, well, either, either you're interested about them or you don't care. So, so, and, and if you're interested, you probably know, I mean, the fracture is, is, is difficult and, and, and so forth. So, so we've got, for, in, there's, there's people who are very interested in, in deep learning methods. So they've been now uh, asked, or they're experimenting also with the OCR problems uh, in, in language technology in our in, in, in Helsinki, so, so that, that's one way. The good thing is that, I mean, that these projects, once you have a funded project that is working on something substantial, then it's easy to c get other people to join who, who work, work are interested in using particular methods, and, and then, I mean, things uh, start developing fairly, fairly well. But, and, and, and this is really, I mean, uh, and this, this open data question, the humanities is something, I mean, for me, the, the difficulties we're facing always when we want any kind of data, historic data to be opened, whether it's national library or whoever has it, the access is really hard to get. And, and also then the research process for the, for the uh, how to share the research data, it, it really doesn't happen. And I, I've been think, thinking about this a lot. I mean, that, that why is it so difficult? And to me, I mean, that we, what, what is really needed is are the cases where we show that the regular, I mean, the ones who don't care about open science, for example, so when they see in their own field that are, these are, are really useful cases, that is when they start caring. Uh, this is how, how and, and so the focus really, I mean, that in the morning, the, the, or was it during the day, that somebody said that we should bring up these cases where, where I mean, some of them can be fairly simple, but so, so that, so the success stories, I mean, that how well in some field where the usually you wouldn't see these uh, methods applied, uh, th that would be, be very, very useful. And, uh, and for example, in history, uh, if you had a, had a kind of a Daria top 10 history projects or something like this, I mean, uh, from all over Europe, uh, we would be very, very interested. It would be very useful, actually. And also, I mean, that, and, and another thing that, that often people don't understand that if I'm talking about the metadata uh, and, and how much actual cleaning up goes into that so that you can take the ESTC catalog and actually produce re reliable uh, analysis of that. So, so it's a quite a bit of uh, work that is done. So, so, so here again, the idea of that building these ecosystems where, where the researchers work together instead of relying on, on, for example, software that is closed. If we all move, we are eventually all moving towards, uh, away from the statistical uh, programs that are, that are closed and you can't touch and, and natural sciences in our environment. So, so also the humanities people, I think, are, are moving towards that direction. But it, the change would perhaps need to be a bit more rapid. And, and what do you get? I mean, that then you do get these uh, reproducible workflows, and which are fairly easy to see. And, and there you can also think about that what is the role of, of repositories and libraries and faculties. And, and at the moment we are using GitHub all the time, but and and because we started with this funded project only 2016, so so the, the kind of a sustainable end place hasn't yet been decided for our project. But but this is also something that that then needs to be thought of exactly on the European level, and, and Daria can do very good things there. So if I just may uh, talk a little bit, I mean, that what we're actually doing. So, so, 
So book, book production or knowledge production in early modern Europe. So hand press period where there's no technological innovation really happening. So 1470 to 1830 more or less is fairly stable. And there, I mean, there's been fantastic book history projects. They're all nationally based. They're all built on, on looking at, at particular countries, whether that's France, Germany, or, or, or Britain and, and, and so forth. What we want to do, we want to use the heritage of the printed book database, clean that up so that you can look at cultural transfer all over Europe. So, so if you're looking at, you're interested about natural law with respect to the question of justice and how that is formulated, just using the metadata, you can be fairly, you can get a fairly, fairly good idea of the, how the Europe, European uh, development goes uh, by, by using these, these materials. And, 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 and uh, another thing is that what we realized is that for the, for the basic, you know, the, the, the basic, very basic, uh, if I think of history of philosophy, the, the, the hair Paul kind of way, I mean, doing the mo most fancy thing, most, uh, that might be interesting that there's a cluster and you can see that, sh I mean, whatever David Hume's works can be found here uh, and, and so forth, they can be good and visual and, and, and inform information can be good as well, but uh, then you ask that, okay, how did you do this? And how, how can I reproduce it? So then, then you usually get to that, okay, then I tweaked something and, 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 and so forth. And the, the workflow becomes very difficult. And it isn't necessarily what the person looking at it from the perspective of history of philosophy in the 18th century would be interested in. So we want to kind of intermediate, so conceptual change, yes, we want to study that, but we want to we study the vehicles or the vessels that move the ideas. So, so the book, just looking at the books can be uh, actually a very good way of doing things. And, and when you're changing the perspective, you clean up the, the imprint part of the uh, title page, uh, and you can look at publishers instead of looking at authors. The world will start looking quite different. So, so, and the impact of, of, of publishers, for example, in the 18th century still was, was very, very quite huge actually. And uh, the fact that uh, we haven't been able to, to do the kind of network analysis of, of publishers and how they act, act uh, it, it just surprises me. So, so material basis of change and then, you know, easy to attach uh, ways of looking at concepts and, 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 and so forth. So, so just a couple examples. So if you want to understand Finland in before 1828, you have to understand it part of Sweden. So what we've been studying is uh, Turku, uh, which was the, the, the main or the capital of, of Finnish area at the time. So we want to look at Turku as part of Swedish university system. That's really what it is. All printing that was happening in Turku was there because of the Swedish pub publishing system. Uh, in, in academic publishing, mainly dissertations. So, so if we just look at the language profile of, of these places, uh, we're very interested, I mean, we have got one part of our group that's working these periphery center kind of questions. And, and if you just look at the language profiles of, of during this time frame from 1650 to 1828 uh, of different countries, uh, I mean, places within the, the Swedish system, Turku uh, language profile is very varied, as you maybe might, might guess, that, that Swedish is the, the main uh, vernacular language. Latin, always you see the, the university town, you, the Latin gives it up in a, in a sense, and, and, and Finnish minority. Uppsala, uh, also a university town, Latin very much present. But then if you look at the Stockholm, what's happening in Stockholm, that is really pressing towards, I mean, just one language, which is Swedish. And, and, and the kind of, kind of way that, that, that how this uh, system then changes, of course, fairly rapidly, Lund being closer to uh, Danish borders. And, and so, so even, even with the, so the very, very, very simple basic uh, looks at the, at the language percentage development, you, you can say quite a bit about the history of the place in, in this sense. But the, I mean, the, the trick here is that you're not studying Turku as part of Finland, you're studying it as part of Sweden. And when you, then you're studying Sweden, you don't, you study it in the European context. And that is possible when, I mean, we're not quite yet there with the project, but that's, that's, that's what we want to do. And these are fairly reliable because the, the metadata has actually been cleaned up. Another thing, I mean, I'd be wondering, I mean, that how would enlightenment, how, how would you see enlightenment in, in, in uh, thesis publications? What, what is taught in different universities? 
And, and, and in Turku, okay, the 18, early 18th century, that's Great Northern War. Uh, so, so the Russian occupation nearly kills all the printing in, in, in Turku. So you have to normalize that in your mind when you're looking at the graph. There's an explanation, which is that. But philosophy, being lo logic and metaphysics, which is very prominent, written in Latin in the, in, the, in the 17th century, that is declining in the 18th century. And what you see is the rise of history, but also history written in the vernacular uh, being Swedish. And, and then economy and, and other topics like that, the, the profile of publishing in, in Swedish in 1750s is growing quite a bit. And, and this is a very European phenomenon. So if you think about, I mean, what is the impact of teaching? I mean, during the Enlightenment, how that changes. Uh, so with fairly easy graphs, I mean, and you can see a particular change. And, and it's not, this is not, not very, very, uh, if you think from the perspective of what you're doing from, with the method, it, it is very, very simple. And, and, and that's really the test of truth uh, to me. I mean, so every time I, I, if I, if I can flip one, some of my colleagues uh, who before weren't interested in the methods. So I, I go on to them and I know that I respect their opinion. I show them that this is what we've done. Do you think it's interesting? So, so if they start being interested, then I find another one so who, who, who really first is skeptical about it. But I, I took Istvan Hont here because I don't know if you know Istvan Hont. He unfortunately recently died. Uh, but, but Istvan Hont in intellectual history is the, the kind of um, one of the eminent, uh, if we're thinking about justice, if we think about enlightenment, it's really Istvan Hunt who has been contributing to the discussion uh, perhaps the most. Not by publishing, but, but the way that he, he was able to influence the way, way that he, he looked at all of these questions. And for him, so the political economy uh, was, was the key concept. Political economy is the one that, if you want to understand 18th century, you study political economy. So, just, I mean, based on this, what we're doing, uh, so we created, I mean, we've been asking for the 18th century collections online, the raw data, for a couple of years now. Last summer we got it, and last week, I'm, I'm talking about this because <laughs> I'm very, very excited about it. So we've got a workflow uh, that we take the OCR 18th century collections online, and we just do very, very, very basic key term uh, phrase uh, searches, but, but we've got a system that we, we can deal a little bit with the OCR problems, mainly because of the, uh, the other project. And then we, we just import it to the ESTC workflow, the, the, looking at the metadata, and then we analyze the, the results there. And that is reliable because uh, sort of, uh, of the way that, um, that we cleaned up the, the metadata. So, so, so just, this is not to refute Istvan Hunt's point, but this is to say that if Istvan, I'm 100% sure that if he had had this in the beginning, this information at the beginning of when he was working on political economy, he would have phrased it in a, little, in a different way. So key term phrase changes isn't going to give you the conceptual change, but it is a good place to start. And there's a lot of things that you can then analyze and do with that. So our eco, eco OCR search, it creates a list of easy ESTC IDs. And, and then the frequency, how, how many times a, a cer certain search, well, how many hits does it get? And, and then the length of the document and characters. And, and then we bring it to an environment, ESTC analysis environment. And what is important, I mean, that all of these steps are reproducible. So, so that if you want to replicate what we do, you can do it exactly. And, and, we, and we, we know exactly what, what is happening. We can even, even look at then, we go back to look at the OCR problems, whether they would need to be dealt in a better way and so forth. So it's reproducible. That, that's what's important for us. But so then, I mean, and, and then, because we've got a, a R markdown file, so we can make reports out of any, if you're interested about any, any terms, and so different kinds of statistical analysis of any key terms and, and, and so forth. I'm just going to show you the graph of use of the term political economy. If you're act actually, if you're interested, if you want to try this out, I can, I mean, we can try, I mean, just come to me and to talk and we can, I can show you what it does, actually. But what we realize when we're looking at political economy, it's of course, uh, I mean, in some sense, it's something that was discussed in, in antiquity already. But uh, in France, 17th century France, it's used in, in, in clearly. But in, in the English context, looking at all of that, it's, the actual term political economy isn't, isn't discussed really. 
Uh, so it's Adam Smith, I mean, that, that's Hunt's favorite. Adam Smith coins it and starts to use it, and it takes a long time uh, to actually then have the kind of impact that, that you would think it has. And, there, and on natural religion is there, there on the other side. So, so it's just a fraction of total documents. As simple as you, know, you can get. The, the percentages are, are, are accurate because that's, the, that's compared to the ESTC. So of course you have to understand that we all, a lot of historians think that you're doing searches on 18th century collections online and it has a lot of 18th century stuff. It doesn't have it all, but, but that's another thing. So, and I mean, okay, I'm just going to, I mean, so the way, I mean, all of this work, how we, how we, how we approach it, that it's multidisciplinary work. You've got computer scientists and you've got humanities people. We got, I've, I've got expert, I mean, expert humanities people in my group who don't do anything with computer science. So, so they get paid, paid by just doing what they were doing before. They're analyzing the, the stuff that we create and, 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 and so forth. So, but the way that we, we want to try to be constructively aligned so that the teaching, the way that we've structured our teaching, it goes towards the same thing. So the, the all aims at the end of the year, every spring, there's a multidisciplinary project where we bring in people from other university, we have humanities people, they work together in a project, they work on those materials that we're working on. I've hired a PhD student who came out of that because he was good, he, he sat with us through the whole year and he was ready for the, for the project to do that start kind of work. So, so everything that we aim at, we're not, we're not care, we don't care so much about teaching that whether we have the, the, the best way of turning a humanities person into a digital humanities person. What we care about are these people ready to work in a multidisciplinary project. And hopefully then also that gives you a, if you don't want to be in academia, maybe you're ready for the world in the, in the sense that you haven't just been doing one humanities thing alone. You, you at least engage with some people and so forth. And we work, it's, I've been talking about intellectual history and, and, and from the perspective of history of philosophy, that's my background, but, but, but also then the social sciences, uh, we work with uh, public broadcasting data, or all, all kinds of stuff in the, in the multidisciplinary project. So, so it, it isn't, we're not training only intellectual historians here, but, but, but it needs to be the core tradition that is affected, that's our thinking. And these, the, we branded this Digital Humanities Hackathon, it's been, in Finland it's been very, uh, very popular. I mean, there's a lot of documentation of that if you, if you want to see what we did. So still, I mean, uh, just uh, about the, the, the resources that we have, I'm thinking from the Daria perspective that, okay, what are these intellectual, whatever, uh, Finnish people, what, what can they, they offer us? Uh, so, so there is actually, I mean, there, there's quite a lot of that we hopefully bring to the table as well. Uh, so, I mean, there's research data, I mean, obviously, I mean, just, I mean, that this kind of research data infrastructures, uh, we've got a Mildred project, uh, I mentioned this earlier, so, so I'm, I'm involved in this. Uh, it's, it's going on currently. Uh, so, so, also, the, this is negotiated very closely with all the national, there's something called data, National Data Committee, there's something called that in Finland. So, so which has all the vested parties there in the same table. So, so from the, if we're thinking about the research data infrastructure, also the, the question of how the humanities research data infrastructure relates to the other. Because, I mean, one way of projecting things is that our needs for computing power are maybe a little bit less uh, in some cases than, than in, in, in other field, natural science, but it's fairly aligned in, in a way. So, so you need some things that you need to, need to be able to customize, but in terms of, uh, unless we invent something completely new, it looks like that we're on a bit of the same track. So, so then you, it is good to follow what is going on in research data infrastructures in general. I mean, uh, so, so, it, it, we, we, so that we didn't want to use the digital humanities when I started working uh, on, on projects. I, I sat down with a friend uh, who works in medicine, I asked him, give me some of your, from your group that wants to work with humanities stuff. And he said that, okay, I know this guy, Leo Lahti. We sat down and we started thinking what we can do. Uh, and, and, and we started building our own, own processes uh, to analyze, especially knowledge production, which is what, what we want to do. But I had the feeling, I mean, that also I did my PhD, even stuff like book history. Helsinki is very strong in intellectual history. That's my background. So the 
Quentin Skinner's Cambridge School of, uh, for some reason, that has been implanted in, in Helsinki in particular. So all of us working in digital humanities, we've been raised up uh, following that. And I wanted to use, I mean, different methods. I, I was very interested about the 18th century collections on right thinking when they, it came out that you could actually use it. And I spent uh, a lot of time even downloading stuff from there and uh, ridiculous things like that. So, so when, when we, I, I first, when we were starting with our uh, kind of big data processes, uh, and I, I was talking to my supervisors and, and, and them, they, they were very, very skeptical, and they still are. And, and, and the, the, the kind of idea that, that w whether we are in between worlds, and then what, what is happening also, what I, I will talk about, is that my worry about digital humanities a little bit is that you go to a different place, that you stop talking to these people where you start from, and, and you create something else, and, and you have a discourse on your own. It needs to be that these are connected and not severe. So the impact on the, on the actual traditions is what, what we're aiming at. And, and that is very much uh, what, what I'm all the time thinking when I'm doing these uh, stuff that, that, that we're doing. And, and well, hopefully, I mean, the, that the in-between worlds, we, we've now got a, also we've got a center for intellectual history. It's very easy to find these, these institutions, by the way. I mean, I mean network basis. But, but anyway, it's a good idea to centralize things. And there's a center for intellectual history, and there's Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities, and these are now working together. They're really communicating, which is, which is important. That is the way to build things so, so we keep in touch all the time. And, and, and that, that is what, what is important for us. So I, I just want to show you, uh, so the kind of a, this is from the application. Um, so what, everything that is involved in, in Heldig Digital Humanities. So close collaboration with computer science. Aalto University is very good in that, and, and also uh, Uni University of Arts, there's one, one like that. So, so in Helsinki region, the idea is that everything is centra centralized, uh, centered in a way that, that we take advantage of the stuff. A little bit like Daria, I think it, it wants to do. So there's all kinds of different things. I'm, I'm, I'm only talking now from the intellectual historian uh, history of philosophy pers perspective, but, but also, for example, that uh, at theology, religion, and, and digital world, that component is, they also want to use as particularly for the focus of the uh, existing research tradition. So there's all kinds of interesting things. Russian studies is very big. Uh, smart cities are on the board, consumer behavior, uh, and so forth. So, and, 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 and also then there's, as you see, there's Finclar in there, but maybe, maybe also Daria, uh, uh, actually Daria will be, be kind of important and a way for us to the, also disseminate our, what we do to other parts and, and then take advantage of, of what others do elsewhere. So, so that, this kind of a setup is very important. Also the memory organizations, not only the National Library, but, but also archives and so forth. Good thing about Finland is that it, when you're in a small, humorless country, is that uh, you can actually do things so that, that you know everyone <laughs> and, and, and you can distribute and communicate if, if the working relationship is good. And of course, I mean, it, so, so, so that, it, that is something, advantage of being small. But so, so, so this is the, uh, the kind of my list of what, what, what we try to focus on and, and what we say when we teach digital humanities, when we promote projects and what we do. I mean, the, the core research questions, they need to come first. And, and the 15 years, I mean, I've been thinking about David Hume for at least 15 years, more than that. But it took me 15 years that I felt that, okay, now I have an actual opinion how his works develop. And, and these are long, long cycles, I mean, that you can't change every year, I mean, that, that now we do this. The method development is, of course, there, but that is also why the research tradition where you're working is, is so very important. The multidisciplinarity, I mean, that comes, I, I think it comes, follows uh, immediately from there. The idea for us isn't that we want to train new type of humanists. Everybody needs to have certain set of skills digital, others, computer science, and so forth, so that everybody speaks at least the same language. But the idea isn't that, that we will have people who are experts. Well, there can be some that are um, that they're the best experts in computer science and also in, in, the, in the particular field of humanities. Usually that's not the case. And that means that the cultural change